Okay, I'm going to do that one more time, and I want you to make so much noise like Roger Clark is standing right next to me. Hello, MCM! Are you ready for our next guest? Yeah, we are. Please put your hands together for Roger Clark! Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. What a warm welcome. It's been an insane weekend <laughs> so far. It's your first UK Comic Con, I think. It think. is, yeah. And like, it was announced like two weeks ago. And then oh, I put it on Instagram, and everyone was like, I can't wait. And the amount of Arthurs and Sadies that I've seen today and yesterday, there's one right there. You guys are awesome, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. I hope you're enjoying MCM London Con. Yeah? Can you all give me a Lenny? How about you do it for a change? Yeah. Nice one, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Tabitha. <laughs> so, I don't know if you've seen any of my other interviews, but I love to play games, and I think it's appropriate. So we're going to play a little game called Last Time. So I have a... Do you mind if I sit next to you? <laughs> Not that you can hear me. So I have a magic egg here with questions in, starting with last time, and I want you to pick your own question and, yeah, answer it for us. So this is last time I was embarrassed in public. <laughs> I, it was probably about 20 or 30 minutes ago, you know, because uh, you guys have been so insane in all of your support and everything, and I want to get through all of you in the line. Sometimes my brain turns into mush, and I'll be asking you the same questions twice in a row, and you're so polite you don't even say it. So I'm like, how's it going? Where are you from? Oh, that's great, man. Thanks a lot for coming. Are you enjoying the con? So where are you from anyways? And then you'll tell me, and you'll be, oh, my God. It's like my brain is mush. So thank you all for everyone who was too polite to say anything. I know I repeat myself a lot. Have you had any great fan moments? Oh my gosh, yeah. There was one time in Dublin about two months ago, this woman brought her seven-month-old in, and he was dressed up as Arthur. And it was the best, no offense to all you guys here today, because you guys are awesome, but I have to say that was one of the best cosplays for Arthur I've ever seen. He was a good boy. Right, are you ready for the next question? All right, cool. Go for it. Let's go for, uh, you don't have red. I don't have red. I'll go for <sighs> Last time I Netflix and chilled, man. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I got a wife and two kids. You know, I work nights because I record a lot of stuff from home. I do a lot of VO and audio books from home. The only time I get to do it is in the middle of the night because the kids are too loud. So that would be the time that I Netflix and chill, but I don't get to do it that often. What should I watch on Netflix? I saw Watchmen, the first, the pilot on HBO. I thought that was really cool. Because I love the graphic novel. The film was great too, but Watchmen on HBO. Check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Euphoria is pretty cool too. Since I is amazing. I've not seen it. I've not seen Check it. Check it out. Yeah. Okay. Let's do one more question. Uh, it better be a good one. Last time I danced in public. Wow. Now. <laughs> I used to be an Irish dancer. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Thank you. Back in the old days, I did it with a kilt on. So <laughs> Irish dancer, tell me more. I need to yeah, know more about that this. That was the thing. Like, my mother got me into it, you know, because uh, I, I, I was born in Jersey, New Jersey, not Jersey over here. And uh, my mother says, you got to go and do your Irish dance and know. And so I hated it, though, because I had to wear what I thought was a dress, but it was a kilt, you know. And if I were to do it now, I'd be more than proud to put that thing on. But yeah, when you're seven years old, everyone's making fun of you. So I said, Mom, I don't want to do Irish dancing anymore. So yeah, that was it. But uh, all right, that was, <laughs> I still got it. So was acting something that you've always wanted to do? Like, did it start from the dancing? Yeah, I guess it did. I was doing amateur dramatics from a very young age, like from five, six years old. You know, the local parish and schools would get me on to do something because they knew I was fearless and, you know, had a big gob. 
<laughs> not much has changed. But I, um, I remember when it was time to go to uni, I didn't want to do drama because I was too scared. You know, I thought there's no way I can make a living out of it. I didn't think it was a secure enough way to be financial in your adulthood and whatnot. So I, I started out doing an HND in computing studies, and I was rubbish at it. I said, you know what? You only get one shot in life. You might as well do what you want to do, what you're passionate at. And, you know, I've been 20 years now as a professional actor, and it's been a, it's been a blessing every single day of it, man, especially now that I get this. This is all gravy, man. You guys are awesome. Because it's not an easy job. Do you find that you had family and friends that supported you? Sorry? It wasn't an easy job. Uh, did your friends and family help support you? Yeah, my father was a lot more supportive than I thought he would be, actually. You know, he said, you, uh, you, got, you got a gift, Raj, and I, I, I support you in whatever you do. And, you know, as I grew up in Ireland, and I, I actually started my career out here. I, went, I trained in Wales, and I started acting out of Cardiff. I eventually made my way here to London because that's where more work was, you know. And uh, when I started to book little things, I started to do TIE. I went all around Britain, going to schools, doing Shakespeare and whatnot, having six and seven year olds scream and curse at me. It was brilliant. Uh, but you know, other times though, you know, if we, you just had to remind yourself that for all the times you had kids throwing each other onto the stages and having to have their teachers tell them to calm down, you know, if you just get through to one, one kid, then you've done your job, you know? So yeah, my, my family have been very, very supportive. And for the last six or seven years now, I can say hand on my heart, I've been able to actually make a living out of this and support my family. And that is the biggest gift that I could have ever wished for. So for any of you that are aspiring to be artists and whatnot, I, my advice to you is be stubborn. Just keep at it. Don't be afraid of failure. Failure is an excellent teacher if you let it teach you. So when did you move back to America? Because you're living over there now. Yeah, yeah, I went back in 08. Yeah, and I've been in the New we went to New York, and uh, I started basically from scratch, you know. But the difference was in New York, here I was getting the Irish roles and I was getting the American roles, but nobody quite trusted my British accent, you know. Over there they trust it. They think, wow, that's really good. He sounds like he's just from London. That's great. I, over there, my, my pigeonhole is about a third bigger than it would have been here. <laughs> Do you miss anything? Is there anything you could take over there with you? Oh, yeah, loads of brown sauce if I could. I'd carry it over by the gallons. I miss all the friends that I had as well. I miss the sense of humor over here. It was fantastic. I don't miss the weather. I don't miss the tube. I do miss the NHS, you know. It's just uh, two countries separated by a common language, you know? It's, it's just crazy. We're, it's, I feel like this is my second home, and it's really awesome to be here again. It's been a long time. Well, we love having you here, right? Ah, <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> You're all right. Um, so I have to congratulate you because you won Best Performance at the Game Awards. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. How was it? <laughs> well, it was insane. Rockstar, they flew, they flew me and my wife out to LA, and I got to sit in that Microsoft Center, and it was absolutely amazing. And I remember before they called out the award, they kept checking to see if I was still in my chair, you know, and they're like, don't go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I says to my wife, why do you think that is? And she says, ah, they probably just want to make sure the camera's on you when they announce your name, you know? <laughs> and then Christoph Waltz calls out my name. I couldn't believe it. So that I get the, the trophy, and as soon as I'm off stage, they take the trophy away from me. They only had one trophy the whole night, I think. And they just kept giving it to everyone. And uh, yeah, well, I got it now. And it, it, was, it was an amazing, an amazing experience. And I do have a lot of you to thank for me getting that, because I know 10% of that vote was public, and I know a lot of you guys chimed in, and you were doing it every day. So thank you, thank you. You guys are awesome. Half of the reason why I got that in my hand was because of all you fellas. Uh, and the game hadn't even been out that long. But you were all awesome, so thank you. Is, was it quite awkward? Because I think some of the other nominees were guesting this weekend. Yeah, I, as I come off, Chris Judge is just standing there. 
But I said, oh, my, so you knew you weren't going to win anyway because you were already backstage. So I said, oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, I, and I, I bumped into young Atreus, too. And then they came out and did that little thing that they did, which was awesome. But I got to meet all the other nominations because I knew Brian's work and I knew Yuri Lowenthal's work and Chris Judge's work. And then that was the first time I actually got to meet them as, as actors and people and whatnot. And so they were so warm in their congratulations. And, you know, I, I, I complimented them on their work, too, because I thought for certain it was going to be one of them. Melisanti Mahut, too, I, I believe lives here. She was amazing, right? So I have to ask about your audition for Red Dead. How did it go down? Did you know you were playing Arthur? No, I didn't even know it was for Red Dead. I didn't even know it was for Rockstar. Um, it was for Take-Two Interactive, so I started to do a bit of research on Google, and I had, a, I had a suspicion, but I had no proof whatsoever. They asked me to come in wearing boots and to prepare a Western accent. And I got these sides. It was modern day, you know. It was about a guy going into a bar, and uh, he was talking to his bartender, who he knows, and they had a relationship, you know. And, the bartender was talking about how his daughter's coming over to visit. And they're like, oh, that's nice. And then at the end of the short, it was about two pages or whatever. And then at the end, I go, okay, well, I got to kill you now. Someone's put a price on your head. And he's like, what? And I'm like, sorry, bud. So I did that. And then they asked me, like, just because it's performance capture nowadays now, you know, so much of it is still voice acting. But loads of it now is also performance capture. So they're asking me to, like, strafe the side of a wall. Asking me to crouch run and, and do all this all over the room. And it's like a choreography of, of just gaming where you have, you're going around with a gun and you're hiding behind the door and whatnot. So they, half of the times, I swear, I just got that job because of the way I walk. Because they knew, I mean, except when you're on horseback, you're looking at Arthur walking like 90% of the time, right? So you want to get a walk that doesn't get on your nerves. Did they get you on a horse? <laughs> I actually didn't go on a real horse for Red Dead. I am a rider, and I can jump, and it's been a while. But yeah, I knew how to ride, but they brought horses in on another week. They, we did, the actors didn't actually get on them. We went on to steel barrels with pipe stick, four pipes sticking out on either end, and they strapped a saddle on the oil barrel. So it was dimensionally accurate. And there was a little head, too, and with some rope around them. But that's all that we ever worked with. And then they got all the horse animations out in, like, I think two weeks. Otherwise, they would have had to shovel up all the poop and all that, you know. <laughs> and getting the balls to stick on their fur, you know. So they crunched it out really quickly, all the horse animations. It was pretty amazing. Do you find it's easier for your acting to have props there with you and acting it out physically? I tell you, all the props that we have and had... They were dimensionally accurate, but they didn't look like they looked, you know? And that's where the animators were so invaluable. I would say the animators worked side by side with the directors because they provided the reference. And for all the actors, there would be times where I'd be like, well, where is this, you know? And they would say, okay, well, come and follow me. And they'd, we'd walk around to the behind of this big, big desk, and they would show me the world. And this was like back in 2013, 2014, I was starting to see this whole extra part of the map that was Red Dead Redemption. So I would be able to actually build context for my performance, and they were invaluable in helping inform me what I had to do and where my environment was, whether it was day or night, what, kind, what was the weather, you know, was it around the swamps of San Denis, so I had to be swatting for flies all the time. Was it way up in the mountains of Coulter, so I had to pretend to be cold? All these little attentions to detail that, you know, gave the game what I feel is a lot of authenticity. And when you did it for as many years as we did, as the actors, we started to learn which questions to ask, you know? Like little tiny reference things, like if you pick up a muddy rock, more than likely it would just be a bit of gaffer tape all rolled up into a ball. But, you know, in game, you know that's going to be dirty, so you got to wipe your hand afterward because that's what Arthur would do. But, I mean, you're just in a, a room like this with, with the same kind of scaffolding hung from the ceilings, and they have the sensors that pick up the data from your mocap balls. So you're wearing a ridiculously tight spandex suit with all these balls. We still had cowboy boots, and I still had a gun and holster. 
And every once in a while, I would wear a hat. But apart from that, we looked, I think Alex McKenna, who plays Sadie Adler, she calls them superhero scuba suits. <laughs> That's kind of pretty accurate. Do you think it's ruined games for you now? Because you like play another game and be like, oh, I know how they did it. Well, you know what? Yes and no, because the way the industry is moving so quickly now, the technology is advancing so fast. I'm starting to see games now, and I'll be like, I don't know how they did that. And I remember I started, I was a huge gamer when I was a kid, and then when I graduated college, I stopped, because I just didn't have the time. But then for some odd reason, like six months before I got the first audition for Red Dead, I just took it up again, and I got an Xbox 360. And I says, I, I'm out of touch. What game should I get? And he says, well, what do you like? I'd be like, I like fantasy. I like sandbox, you know. And he gave me Skyrim, and he gave me the first Red Dead Redemption. So I was playing that, and I loved it. <laughs> and Red Dead Redemption was the only game that my wife actually enjoyed to watch, too, by the way. She loved the scenery, and she liked the horses and whatnot. But I remember when we were working on Red Dead Redemption 2, I was playing like a lunatic, and it was for research. And I would genuinely say that. Look, I'm doing this for work, okay? Yes, it's a hell of a lot of fun, but I'm actually doing it for professional reasons. Because I wanted to see the way it blends in and out of cutscenes, you know, the way we have interactive cutscenes now, where the player very seldom loses control. And I just wanted to see from the animator's perspective, you know, how you would go in from gameplay into a cutscene and see how that now works kind of seamlessly the way they do it. It's amazing. And so I, when I understood the needs of the animator better, it made my job better and it made, it made it easier for me to give them what they wanted, you know. And after a couple of years, we started to work really well together. So I've got to ask, so if you could be in any other game, which franchise or... If I could be in any other game. Yeah, what would you like to do? What part? What character? Oh, my gosh. Wow. There's so many. If I could go way back, you know, I'd love to be one. I'd love Blanca. I remember Blanca from Street Fighter. Oh, man. I got so good where I could do it at level seven with one hand. I could beat M. Bison. No problem. But there's so many things coming out now, and there's so many new titles, and there's so many sequels. You know, I just... I was lucky enough to watch this, this industry get better and better and the technology just get better and better and advance. I, um, I feel really privileged to be a part of it and I just hope to carry on and continue. And there's so many studios like Naughty Dog, Santa Monica, Bethesda, Hideo Kojima's new game coming out next month, Death Stranding, that looks insane. I, uh, I just want to do as much as I can. I'm in one next, coming out next year, it's a 2D platform, it's from an indie Welsh studio called Thrike House, it's a game called Lunafon, Brian Deckhart and Amelia Jones are doing it, Jack Septicai's in there as well, I play an Irish rabbit, so it's a little different from Arthur. You beat me, I was just going to say, what are you working on next? Yeah, and... that's the one I can talk about, yeah, that should be out next year. <laughs> okay, so I want to throw some questions to you guys, so if you want to queue up and get your questions answered, go to the mic. <laughs> this is where we're going to be here till seven now. <laughs> yeah, do you want to go? Yeah, I just wanted to start out by saying uh, thanks just for your work on the game. It was... Um, just one of the most immersive, it stayed with me after, you know, Arthur's story particularly stayed with me for a little while after I finished the game. Uh, I just wanted to ask, could you see, do you think that the ending for Arthur was inevitable or do you think you could have seen another, another path for him? Yeah, it's a good question, you know, I mean, redemption's in the title, right? So, um, and there's so many different arcs and ways that that could have happened. John has his own path of redemption, so does Arthur, but neither of them get really happy endings. I remember we were working on it pretty early on when I found out what was going to happen to Arthur. And of course, there's little variations depending how you play him. There's four different endings, but it pretty much always ends up with... Spoilers, 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 spoilers. <laughs> it ends up with his demise. And if there was some way... I know some people would like, oh, if only he had been able to go to Canada and meet up with Mary and live happily ever after. You know, would the story have been as effective? I don't know. It's... For me, 
when Arthur gets diagnosed with TB, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. <laughs> It's, it's that that gives him the new perspective on life. And it's that that makes him question his whole life up until that point. And I think it changes the way he looks at life. And, and once he realizes that his time on the planet is finite and he has a limited time left, he finally realizes that he, he owes it. He owes it to himself. He owes it to the gang that he dearly loves and is loyal to to try and do some good, or at least more good than he had been doing in the past. So without that death sentence, for lack of a better word, I don't, I don't necessarily know if he would have had the same redemption. You know, if he had lived happily with, ever after with Mary, he might not have had an incentive to become a really good guy, you know, and him and Mary could have ended up being miserable because he wouldn't leave the outlaw life, like, just like John and Abigail, you know? Thank you very much. Hi. Um, Hi. Um, I think you kind of... A bit closer. Sorry. I think you kind of answered it, but when do you think he fell out of, like, believing Dutch had a plan? <laughs> when did Dutch stop having a plan? That's a good question. You know, I think when Arthur starts to realize it, I think it's quite late. Because he really does believe in Dutch. And he's loyal to Dutch, even to the very end. Even after Dutch betrays him, Arthur isn't angry at him, you know? And I think that's one of the differences between me and Arthur, you know, because I would have been like, Dutch, man. But he never stops believing in Dutch, even though he knows Dutch is totally fallen to the wayside and he's not the same man that he used to be and he's not the leader that he used to be. When that actually happens, that's a very good question. But I think the definite moment where there's de no doubt in his mind is when... They're helping out eagle flies, and you remember that bit where Arthur gets attacked, and uh, he's got the knife, and he's just about to push it into his chest, and you see the steam shooting out, and Dutch's feet go to help Arthur, and then you see the feet stop and turn around and walk out again. I think that's the moment when Arthur knew. That's the moment when Arthur knew he couldn't trust Dutch anymore. Hey there, cowpoke. Howdy, fella. <laughs> so first off, uh, thank you for portraying the character brilliantly. I thought it, when the first game came out, it was going to be very hard to sort of match John Marston's level. Um, and then, of course, Arthur Morgan's shown him like, oh, nah, not this guy. It's all about John Marston. And oh, yeah, John Marston's like four or five years ago, all forgotten about because you set a new high level for Rockstar Games. Um, better than Grand Theft Auto characters. Um, met Cousin Nobel, who plays Hosea, a few months ago, actually, and he spoke about the uh, game series as if it was like a film and how you all worked together, which was, you know, really beautiful. You put a lot of emotion into work, so thank you. It really worked well. Um, the question really is for you, and I know everyone's got it on their mind, is that when we finished the game, we finished John's sort of story, we're all kind of hoping for, like, a DLC, like the next chapter, maybe another Red Dead Nightmare sort of thing going on. Um, I know you can't say if it is, but is this, if there was something like that, would you, would you like to continue that sort of work and continue off a story in another way? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If, if, Red, if Rockstar were to call, I would happily go back to work for them. It was a joyous, joyous experience. Great contract. You know, they're one of the best studios in the world, you know? And uh, every single one of them, so intelligent, so talented, I would jump at the chance to work with them again. Yeah, absolutely, man. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And the fact that you guys keep saying that you want a DLC, too, is awesome. Thank you so much. That, I mean, the fact that you appreciate it enough to want more of the gang and more of the story, you, that really, thank you. That means a lot. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. So, I'm, long story short, I'm actually doing the dissertation based on the commodification of the American frontier. Um, Red Dead Redemption 2 particularly is one of the examples I'm going to be using. So I just wondered if I could ask you like a couple of quick questions, just because you know it obviously better than most other people. I'll try to answer. <laughs> it sounds very intellectual. I can't Let's guarantee make you a it very one smart question, answer. Yeah, make it one question. I'll try. Um, in that case, um, how do you think actively engaging with the game as both a user and creator shaped the frontier image for you? Oh, okay. So, obviously, Arthur's journey is somewhat up to the player. You can choose whether or not you want to be honorable or dishonorable. How that affects the frontier and the environment of New Austin and Hanover and Lemoyne, etc. 
you know, it deeply affects it. But it usually, it's not until like the latter half of the narrative where you start to see a genuine effect of Arthur's behavior on the world around him. Like, if you go into Valentine enough times and just shoot the whole place up and murder loads of people, then eventually when you start walking around there, people aren't going to be friendly to you, you know? And I think the creators definitely intended for there to be consequences to your actions within the game. That's something that Rockstar Studios have been really, really keen to try and communicate, that there are consequences to how you choose to play Arthur Morgan. And for me, another challenge was, you know, especially in the latter half of the game, because that's where the, the consequences of, of what, how you choose to do it are, are most prevalent, is I would try to come up with a way that would make it work, whether you played him dishonorably or honorably, to try and come up with enough of an ambiguity so that it would make sense either way. And that was kind of a challenge. But then whenever I struggled with it, though, I would always remind myself, you know, people are complicated. People... People contradict themselves all the time. That's what makes us human beings, you know. And whenever there's something that we have a motivation which, you know, ultimately serves our purpose, yeah, we'll change our story if it suits us. And I think Arthur is no different from that, you know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hiya. So, um, How's it going? Not too bad. Uh, so, um, I played Red Dead, the first one. Um, I was quite young at the time. Um, I thought John was going to be incredibly hard to beat. He's and awesome. John, Mar John Marston's the man, man. Yeah, and I mean, playing Red Dead 2 and seeing the ending, and I, I went down the honourable path, seeing you, sort of, or Arthur, on the cliffside with the song and the music and everything else was amazing, and I'd just like to honestly thank you for that, um, because it was just one of the best performances I think I've ever seen, and I'm quite a heavy gamer. Um, Thank you, man. Thank my, you. My question is, uh, so I went down the honourable path um, after finding out that Arthur had tuberculosis. Um, and during the scene where Dutch is chasing John um, and yourself, uh, Arthur gives John his hat. Um, and is that him accepting him as a brother finally, like John wanted? Or w did Arthur always think of John like a brother? I think Arthur always thought of John as a brother, you know, and the, all the complications that result from that sort of relationship, you know, because there's definitely a huge love-hate thing, especially at the beginning of the game. Arthur resents John. He thinks he's a little punk, you know, and there's definitely the older brother, younger brother relationship that we wanted to try and communicate from day one. But thank you for what you were saying earlier, because I think I love John Marston. John Marston is the OG as far as I'm concerned, and I never forget the first day I worked with Rob Weedoff. It was the mission where you rescue him from the wolves, so it happens pretty early on in the game. And I, of course, have played Red Dead, the first Red Dead by this point. I was like, I saw my pages, and I had to basically trash talk him and throw him over my shoulder as if he's nothing and say how useless he is all the time. And I was like, I can't say that to John Marston. But when he gives him his hat, <clears throat> I think that's it's just... A, Another example of how good the writing is, because it's a, it's a visual metaphor for passing on the torch, you know, because it's not long after that where you start playing as John. And uh, I think it was just kind of a more of a visual writing piece more than anything else, because Arthur knows at that stage, yeah, this is it for me. But if there's one last good thing I can do, please let it be that John can get back to his family safely. So... Um, it's kind of, yeah, there's a big fraternal thing, putting the hat on there and giving them the satchel, too. Because uh, Arthur, I think that's Arthur saying goodbye, not just to John, but to the world itself, you know? Uh, thanks a lot for what you were saying earlier, though. Thank that's you. That's great, man. Cheers. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Roger. How are you doing? All right. Um, as we all know, today marks the one-year anniversary of Red Dead Redemption 2. I know, isn't that, Such Matt? Such an awesome yeah, let's game. Have a year to the day. Brilliant, brilliant game. Um, a year ago today, most of us were sat in front of the PS4 or the Xbox. I know I certainly yeah, was. Yeah, at midnight, I was waiting for it. Uh, so, as an actor uh, in the game, when you were making it and stuff, you were performing, was there any part where, uh, what was the most challenging part in filling the boots of Arthur? Uh, was there any particular struggle or difficult part in the performance capture? Well, when I found out what Arthur's main journey was going to be, and when I found out that he also was going to have... Uh, 
you know, a timely end within the game, just like John Marston. I wanted to find out like the similarities, but also the differences between Arthur's redemptive path and John's. And you know, after a while, I, I, I knew that I just had to get that out of my head because any attempts to try and fill John Marston's boots were not going to work. It was going to be an exercise in futility because you can't redo what Rob Weedoff did. So I kind of realized, look, I got to do my own thing here and let John be John and Arthur's got to be his own kind of character. So having to come up with a unique way to approach his own redemptive arc with the information that I had, which wasn't a lot, you know, and whatever information I did have, the writers could change it if they wanted to. It did happen, you know, because it's, uh, it's not a finite path. It was five years we were doing that. Things would change, you know, some things after a couple of months we'd realize it doesn't work, so we would tweak that, maybe have to go back and fix something else because of it. So it was very much a liquid journey, for lack of a better term. Yeah. But I guess to go back to your original question, some of my inspirations when I was working on Arthur, I, I did take a lot from Toshiro Mifune, who you, some of you might know, he was the lead guy in many of Kurosawa's films. He was in Yojimbo and Sanjuro, which, funnily enough, were based on Fistful of Dollars and for a few dollars more. So there was this Japanese actor walking around as a samurai that I, I took a lot of pages from, took a lot of notes from him. And, uh, you know, I just watched Westerns. I watched Westerns constantly. And the, the way that they evolved from when they began, like, over 100 years ago now. And John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, and even now more modern-day stuff, you know. It's, it's a quite, quite a journey of the whole genre. And now it's not even cinema anymore. Now it's in video games, too. Yeah. Thank you so much for your answer. Cheers, Thank you. man. Thank you. Hey, Roger. How's it going, man? <laughs> Getting good. Uh, we were talking about earlier how, how you got into uh, like audition for uh, Arthur Morgan. How long did you know that you were going to play Arthur Morgan? Um, I didn't know. I said a couple of years. He said a it'll probably be a couple of years. I think the, uh, the three main protagonists on GTA V, they worked on that for three. And I think they, there's no way it's going to be more than GTA V. So three years max. But no, it was five. Okay. <laughs> five years, yeah. I loved every minute of it, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello again. Uh, so Arthur has become a very iconic and a much, much loved character for a lot of people here and everywhere else. So it's a character that stays with you even after the game is over, right? So do you have yourself a favorite fictional character from a game or otherwise something else? Sorry. A fictional character from a game or something else? Uh, or at least a character that is close to your heart, a fictional character, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, like I said earlier, a lot of the work of Toshiro Mufune is awesome. Mm -hmm. Do any of you know Mice, uh, Mice and Men? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like a lot of the characters from that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think a lot of, of America's history is a metaphor for cult, American culture, mm -hmm. how this, this expressed desire to push out westwards and to explore the unknown and people joining together to, to try and escape what they used to have for whatever reasons, be it honorable or dishonorable. I like that metaphor a lot in a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to Watchmen, we were talking about Watchmen earlier on HBO. I love some of the main characters in that. The way they've complicated and the way Alan Moore and Gibson just made superheroes more human, mm -hmm. you know, and made them more complicated. Just like Arthur, I really enjoyed that stuff too. Uh, I like a lot of Russian literature, too. I like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and some of the characters that he's written in there. There's a huge, huge plethora of, of influences. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Can I cut in with a question? <laughs> um, can you speak other languages? Did you have to do any different, like... I, I'm not... I, I can speak a little bit of French and a little bit of German. That's about it, yeah. Yeah, but like most English speakers, I'm pretty lazy when it comes to it. <laughs> You know, because everyone is so good at English. You know, I, I can speak ba very basic French and German. Yeah. How's Hi it going? Right. Yeah, not too bad. Um, so I don't know about anyone else, but when I got to like the last kind of horseback ride with Arthur, going down the road, and that song started playing. There was a moment when I was just holding the controller, I was sitting there going, "I don't think I can do this anymore. I really don't want to see what's going to happen." 
and I actually felt a bit of emotion. I'm quite a, I'm not a stone-hearted person, but for the first time in a video game, I actually felt some tears go down my face. And it was just like, for me, I was saying to all my friends, like, I've never felt this much emotion in a game in my entire life. I said, everyone's just got to try it. Um, my question is, like, out of all the characters and roles you've done, is Arthur like one of the characters that you've grown most attached to over the years? Absolutely, without a doubt. He's the longest character that I've ever worked on, and uh, he's also the most, most material of, of character that I've ever worked on. And when I started working on him, I didn't necessarily know where the end was going to take me. You know, there were lots of little nuances of Arthur that I began to discover probably in the first year of doing it. Um, and when you're, doing on, when you're working on an, a character like that, and it's constantly new material for such a long period of time, he evolves. He evolves in a, a very organic way, in a way that you don't necessarily anticipate. So it was exciting to see whatever pages came to me week by week, how that would affect Arthur's journey and the way I chose to perform him. But towards the end, though, I'll be honest, I started to get a little self-conscious, and I was like, can you just show me some of the stuff I did in the first year? Because I have no idea whether this is actually the same character or not. So they, but they, uh, as always, the animators were, were absolutely invaluable. Because they would go, absolutely, Raj, yeah, no problem, here. There's something you did in like month two. And I would go, okay, all right, I guess that's the same person. Thank you so much. So all right, trying, to keep, trying to keep a consistency over five years was one of the biggest challenges I ever had as a performer. Cheers, yeah. thanks very much. No, thank you, man. Cheers. Hi. Hi. Um, was there anything in the story that actually, like, really surprised you that you weren't expecting at all? And do you think that Dutch ever really had a plan? <laughs> you know, I think Dutch, up until Hosea dying, I think Dutch had a plan, you know? And even to this day, if you go to Benjamin Byron Davis, he'll say, you, yes, of course he has a plan. Make a whole lot of noise make it tons of money, and get the hell out of here. That's Dutch's plan, in whatever circumstances he finds himself in. But I think when Hosea, spoiler, 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 when Hosea dies, I think that's, that's, when, that's when Dutch starts to go awry, you know? That's when the, as Ben says, when the cheese starts to fall off of the cracker, because Hosea is his conscience, and uh, Hosea is the good angel over one shoulder. And when Hosea goes, then we have the little devil of Micah appearing over the other shoulder. You know, and he boosts up Dutch's ego, and he tells Dutch what he wants to hear to the point where he becomes very, very bad, and he gives him a lot of rotten advice and makes him distrust Arthur. But um, what was the first part of the question again? Um, oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Was, there, was there any part of the story that, like, really surprised you and that you weren't expecting um, I remember, I wasn't involved in it, but I remember at the very end, you know, when you, uh, when you face down Micah up, way up in the mountains, I wasn't expecting Dutch's appearance at the last minute, just bursting through those doors. And I didn't know exactly what he was going to do, and I didn't expect him to shoot Micah either. But when he did, when Dutch shoots Micah, that tells, at least me anyway, that Dutch knew he was wrong. And he knew, the reason he shoots Mike is because he can't shoot John, and he can't shoot John because he knew Arthur gave his life to make sure that John would live. So that was kind of, I think, in my, what I think is Dutch's way of apologizing to Arthur was by taking Mike out eventually in the end. He was just about five or six years too late was all. Thank you. Thank and, you. Um, you should also watch The Good Place on Netflix. Yeah? Yeah. All right, thanks. <laughs> nice cosplay. Hello. I saw you already. You yes, look, you look already fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, mine's quite a nerdy question about performance capture. So as you said at the beginning in your audition, you were having to do little crouch runs and everything like that and yeah. hiding through doors. So through your actual time as Arthur in the volume, how many hours or how many little idols and movements were you having to do? And did you have to do loads of them in one day? And also, when you have to practice getting shot at, was it you doing it or was it a stunt man who had to fall onto a crash mat to do it? That's a really cool question. So if it's in-game, uh, getting shot would be done by the ragdoll physics. 
But if it was in a cutscene for whatever ha chance, and I don't think Arthur actually gets shot in cutscenes, but there were times when I had to do it in a cutscene, then you react as if you're getting shot because they're filming it. You know, it's not the the in-game physics don't apply for a cutscene where the player is just watching it. So in those cases, then you know it, it was it was actually quite fun because they would get loads of padding, <laughs> so you knew that no matter how outlandish your death was, you weren't going to hurt yourself. So I remember doing that for a bit. Uh, and uh, the first part, what was the first part of equipment? How, how many idle oh. moves and everything have you had to do? So five years, and we would typically work three weeks on, two weeks off. And in the two weeks off, we might do VO, a bit of VO work in the booth. So the in-game animations, I, 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 some of the animators would be able to tell you the exact number of hours, but I think they told me that, like for example, lines of dialogue, I did close to 100,000. Uh, if we were just talking simple hours in the mocap suit, I think it wouldn't be far away from a couple of thousand. I worked with almost a thousand actors all throughout the game, both you know in the in the volume, which is where you do the performance capture. I think we'd had about 850 actors from all around the New York area. I've I still walk through New York sometimes, and I, I'll say, hey, how's it going? I know so many people now. <laughs> all these working guys and girls all over the tri-state area. And it was a joy to work with every single one of them. So uh, yeah, performance capture is, I know I said it earlier, but so many people still think that what we do is voice acting. And voice acting is still a huge part of gaming, but performance capture is really starting to take over the way the main story is being told, especially as in terms of the playable characters and the main characters, you know? It's done not that dissimilar from film or theater. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just to cut in, I think we've got time for three more questions. Um, so the others, unfortunately, if you can take a seat. But don't worry, because Roger will be in the autograph section after this panel. So go and say hi and get an autograph whilst yeah. you're there. Sorry, guys. Thanks. <laughs> you all right? Um, hold on. Is uh, Red Dead getting any... Is it evolving? Is it evolving? Yeah, instead, instead of like horses, it could be cars. <laughs> well, definitely not cars, but I think the online is constantly evolving. Red Dead Online, they keep adding new stuff. I mean, when the, when the beta got lifted in June, I couldn't, I couldn't believe all the new missions they have on there. They've got different character classes. You know that the future holds a lot in store for Red Dead Online, much the same way that they did it with GTA Online. I think that aspect of the game is definitely evolving. Mm. But as far if you put cars in Red Dead, it wouldn't be Red Dead anymore. I don't know, you know. You could just like mix it up, maybe like maybe make it flying cars. Oh right. I think you could play GTA for that, mate. Oh no, yeah, that's that's future GTA, isn't it? Flying horses. <laughs> Get wings on them. Alright, I'll let them know. Yeah. Um. Cheers, man. Thanks a lot. So my question is, like, when you were like doing the like, what is it called? When you were like recording the animations with your body movements, what, did you ever had the like the urge to like pick off one of the like senses and like rip them apart and look inside? Oh my gosh! If I did that, I would be in so much trouble because I would ruin the whole take. They'd be like, "What are you doing? Oh my god, we gotta do this all over again!" Because they're. You would have to do what was called a ROM. Every time you put the suit on, you'd have to do a ROM, which stands for range of motion, so that the cameras would calibrate where your dots are. So then if I were, like, for example, if we're both in mocap suits and we're standing right next to each other, the sensors don't confuse my arm with Tabitha's arm because we did a ROM at the beginning of the day, and so the, the computers know who's who. If I were to tear off the ball, I would throw all that out the window and then I'd, I'd, I'd halt production for at least like an hour. And so... I'd have free arms. Oh, my God. You know, the worst thing you could ever do is throw a bag of glitter in. It would take them half a day to... Because even the tiniest little speck of glitter, all the sensors will think that's a, that's a ball. Do you know from experience? <laughs> no, it, it never happened. It never happened. But you should have seen the look on the engineers' faces if I ever mentioned it. They'd be like, no... No. Why? Have you got glitter on you now, Raj? Because you need. It's like it's like I had Ebola, man. Get the hell out of here right now. Yeah, glitter is, glitter is like the worst virus in the world in mocap. 
It's the worst word in the, in the world for mocappers. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Hello, Arthur. How you doing? Um, I'm sure I can speak for a lot of people here when I say that um, the characters that you guys bring to life mean a lot to people. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to take a picture with all of the Red Dead cosplayers that have come here. Because of the course. Because means so much to them. Yeah, we'll do it well, straight well, after now. Yeah. Yeah, if we can get the Red Dead cosplayers to just line up in front of the stage. And yeah, can come on up to yeah. the front right now. Yeah, just line up in front of the stage. If you got a Red Dead outfit on, it'll be awesome. Let's do it. Look how many there are. Oh, my gosh. I didn't realize there was this many. Get the cameras out, guys. Come on up on the stage, guys. It's better lights. Not on the stage, please. Not on the stage. That was my fault. I told her to get on the stage. Did you want a gun? There we are. <laughs> I'm going to take a, a pan of this, too, Should we too, do a man? selfie? Will you take one for me? Of course, yeah. Thank you. Outlaws for life, guys. Right. So on the um, on the count of three, we'll, I suppose we could do a, a nice Lenny, yeah? Shall we? All right. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. Woo. Thank you, guys. Outlaws for life. You guys are the best. Thanks to all the cosplayers. Thanks to you guys as well. Don't forget, I'm at my table for about half a Another half hour, all right? Thank you so much. You're all, you're awesome. Well, one time, guys. give it up for Roger! Hey, thank you guys. Whose gun is this?